we sat down in a pizza express and similar like why don't we do sustainable fashion and then i was like there's only one person that dresses worse than me in the world and that was charlie my co-founder so <laughs> like, we we literally cannot do fashion yeah. you know quickly you're looking at where people are using products on a regular basis and where there's a, a lot of plastic and a lot of opportunity in the bathroom was quite kind of obvious to us we didn't know how big that opportunity was going to be you know when we first met every vc they all said yeah like this is ridiculously niche this is never going to work Quick one, fellas, you probably heard a few months ago I dropped an e-com course, a very fucking guru of me, but it's not that, I promise you. Zero to one, how to start a brand from scratch with no budget, some budget, a bit of budget, take your idea from a bedroom to reality to potentially seven, eight figures in sales like I've done a few times based on my seven years of experience in the trenches and my current experience building my current brand, Space Goods. It's no bullshit, no frills. We've had like 75 people go through so far. Not a single person has asked for a refund. Plenty of people have actually built some seriously impressive shit. Covers every aspect of the business, not just the front end stuff like most gurus on YouTube and Twitter are talking about, not just product, market and all that shit, but the real shit, the logistics, the back end, the supply chain, the customer service, the finances as well. This covers the whole spectrum, every part, 12 hours of video. If you're interested in scaling a brand, a zero to one, actually turning our idea finally into a reality, then click the link below, go check out Learn Real Commerce course and let me know what you think. I'd be glad to have you in there. Let's fucking go. Right then, we're back with the Midnight Pod, I think episode 47, and we have someone that I probably messaged ages ago to try and get on the pod, but because I had no views and wasn't really doing anything interesting at the time, I probably didn't get a reply. We have Freddie Ward from Wild Cosmetics, which is actually a brand that I know quite a lot about, because I always often joke that I come on here and get founders that I haven't done any research, and I basically let them speak to me for 90 minutes, fill me in, but... I've kind of followed your brand, probably not since the start, but certainly for about 18 months, because just being an entrepreneur myself, founder myself, obsessed with D2C, I actually nearly tried to kind of rip off your brand when I was thinking about the next thing to do. Not rip it off, but go into that like vegan bathroom stuff, I end up pivoting and going to mushrooms instead, as, as everyone knows, it watches the pod. But you've probably got an interesting story because you didn't come from always being a founder. You were at HelloFresh for a few years, I think, and then obviously I've built a brand to 50 employees, raised like 8 million plus in funding, at least from what Crunchbase says. And I assume that means it's going pretty well. And you launched a little over three years ago. And I guess you are where I would like to be in three years time in terms of founding a D2C brand and doing cool shit. So it's gonna be an interesting chat, I think. And like with every guest, the first question really is just a bit about your background. Where did it start? Like, I guess maybe from like, school slash university age and we'll go kind of chronologically through and we'll probably dive into a load of stuff like d to c specific and a load of stuff i want to know because this is the great thing about the pod is that i get to pick the brains of people that i want to actually speak to on a tuesday night for free so hopefully i can learn a lot as well as everyone else watching cool well yeah thanks thanks for having me on and um yeah, uh, don't, don't believe everything you read on Crunchbase, but I think we're about 30 employees now. So, um, but have raised about, yeah, seven and a half million. Um, and um, also just, I love D2C. It's, like, it's all, I've, all I've ever done in my career and um, really passionate about it. Um, find it super interesting. Um, so kind of enjoying, uh, enjoy, enjoy talking about it. And also just big fan of entrepreneurship and you know trying these things and kind of sharing any any kind of learnings um we, we can talk about wild and what that journey's been like and um you know and I, I but i always think to you know the start like these things from the outside look like oh, it's going so well and things are you know mm. you're so successful but like the day-to-day -day grind <laughs> doesn't change much and the yeah. feeling of like uh you know challenges and things going wrong uh you know keep keep scaling so it's been it's been a super interesting challenge and, and super super enjoyable um but yeah if, if if i take you back um so basically how i fell into entrepreneur or like a more entrepreneurial environment um did history at university which not that useful for like a career um and then tried to get onto all these kind of grad schemes and kind of don't have that traditional sort of particularly academic background or not not what any of these sort of tests and things were kind of looking for so a little bit by force 
had to go down a less kind of conventional route um and uh and also kind of you know had some things that i was interested in so i was really interested in food and i enjoyed talking to people that was kind of my two things that i was like ah um those are two sort of vague things that i enjoyed doing in my life um and so to actually started for working for a company called firefly tonics which was a premium um sort of non-alcoholic drinks uh, mm. business um and literally it, it wasn't particularly glamorous i would fill my rucksack with um these drinks and some ice packs and i would go around london um trying to sell into like small was this as a grad i was just like as a grad oh, yeah okay yeah cool. and so that was my and but um that was my first like proper job in london um did okay like sold a few of these drinks um so that was that was quite good and and this company um had this really cool office actually in in bishop's park in fulham i was like this is like what an amazing place to um to kind of work i obviously never got to go into the office because i was like trudging around trying to flog these these drinks that never quite kind of made it but um gave me a real taste for um a smaller company and, and what that could be like and felt like a place that I could be a lot happier um so I started looking for other food and drink startups in London and applied for like a, a internship at this company called Hello Fresh which at the, the time was like a couple of employees um and no one had ever heard of what a recipe box was and and I told my family, they're like, that's never going to work. It's a terrible idea. Um, so, um, and, and um, you know, one of the great things about startups when, they, when they're first launched and no one knows about them is no one can find their jobs um, and they don't have much of a budget to promote their jobs. So if you're lucky enough to find them and find their, uh, something there, you've got a very good chance of um, getting, getting in. So mm. that's, that's kind of how I got into to HelloFresh and that was in, in kind of 20, um, kind of 2012-ish. Um, they're like multi-billion pound valuation now are they? i think they're doing they're a german like company german company yeah. yeah so they the um they're doing about four billion in revenue oh shit That's um big. and um i think valued around six seven billion mm. um but have been in excess or close to 10 billion i think at the height of the pandemic um it's a rocket internet company so what yeah. rocket do what rocket did is they find business models that were successful and kind of took them to countries that they weren't in. And, and normally that would be like finding Americans. So like they copied Airbnb, mm. um, they copied eBay, which is the original model that they made a lot of money from. But HelloFresh was a bit different. It was, it was a big model in Sweden. Um, so it accommodated for about two and a half percent of the uh, grocery market in Sweden. Um, and they were like, oh, this is like quite an interesting concept. Let's see if we can take it to more countries. So they launched in Berlin, London and Amsterdam pretty much simultaneously. Um, and then they set up small satellite teams in in those three kind of markets. Mm. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so I was one of the, the kind of early guys in the, in, in the London office. Was that like with equity? And stuff like that back then. Or you literally just, you just um, so so to begin with, no equity, no no um, no kind of. Um, it, it was literally just a job. Yeah. Um, but you know, with time. Um, but did you did know, you choose that? I guess because you you were smart enough to think that might be the case in the future, and it's a great way to learn more than being in a bigger company. Or? I, I didn't think that hard about it. I just thought yeah. like, um, look, I like food. I I, I want to get into this sort of world. I will think I can learn a bit and, you know, I'll go move on to the next company or do the next thing when the timing's kind of right. So, yeah. you know, you didn't, I definitely didn't overthink it. Um, and I never thought that, you know, where my career ended up going would, would kind of happen there. It just all happened kind of naturally. And, and I learned a lot more about startups and you know i probably didn't have a clue what equity was or yeah. like how that worked or what that even means um and you know on my journey through that i've, I've kind of obviously learned a bit more about that side of things yeah, yeah. and how long do you spend there then six years yeah. going from like relatively junior to w w where did you end up when you left and i guess what was the thought process with leaving as well which yeah so i think like thing? roughly the marketing budget 
so so I was the first kind of marketing sales and marketing hire um and we probably spent like a hundred grand in in our first year on on marketing and then by the time I left I think we spent about 25 million on mm. on marketing and I was running a team of about 25 people um and um yeah it was just an amazing amazing kind of journey um and the business had IPO'd um you know it it, it it had actually hit a bit of a plateau in the UK and um it sort of became clear that I didn't have the energy and perhaps the business needed a new bit of fresh blood and the yeah. guys who've come in have done and then have made it a lot lot bigger than it was when I uh, mm. uh when I left so I think it was um it was a good time for a change and th- you know it, it was at that stage a billion over north of a billion by that point um so it's a big company you know thousands and thousands of employees um and you know you're basically working for the equivalent of like a Unilever or PNG you know it's like yeah. it, it is a big corporate and that became an environment where I'm not the like I'm not wasn't the best person to be in in mm. in in those roles and I was ready to like go and try and um take what I'd learned and and apply that somewhere um and 25 million on on marketing is that primarily like social ads like you might assume now is that is it different back then even though it was only a few years ago no that was that was um it didn't start out as a social at all so um social media sort of exploded halfway through my mm. time there um but um you know w- when you're spending that much it's across like um quite a lot of different channels i think we probably had like 30 channels but yeah. a lot of that is you know paid social um paid social spend and like scaling that mm. um so you probably you know you're spending a decent amount on 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 those channels as, as yeah. we grew and how long were you thinking about doing your own thing or was, was that always planned to, to be the next step like, would you have considered yourself an entrepreneur before you even started at HelloFresh? No, no, I never, right I was never like, oh, I'm just going to be, you know, some people are like, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm yeah. No, we don't work with someone that's, and for me, um, I didn't, I didn't have that sense at all. I was just, I, I, I kind of have ended up there through what I've done. And I, th- I think, you know, I'd seen a lot of re- companies that had gone through and been successful and then you know they those people who'd been part of that had gone into the ecosystem and set up their own so like innocent who are uh, um the guys are now investors in in wild as part of jam jar their fund but yeah um you know a lot of the guys who went on that innocent journey uh you know first 10 20 employees they went to set up some amazing like brands in the food and beverage space and they're they're like all over that ecosystem now mm. and then similarly if you look at d2c a lot of the great d2c guys started at love film um they then went on to grace they then went on to tails they then went on to skin mm. and me it's all a lot more connected yeah. than you than you um than you think and what what i kind of from an outsider's view i was like well look what these guys have been able to learn through those experiences have have then put them in quite good stead to go and set up their own kind of companies yeah i mean <laughs> that's definitely a lot to be said for that because i always joked that the first six years of me being an entrepreneur with some wins and plenty of losses was kind of like my equip i guess my own equivalent of maybe working in, not working in a bigger company but now i feel like i finally kind of know what i'm doing a little bit more i'm still figuring it out but yeah i think it's maybe a bit of a unicorn story where you get a first-time founder that you know is 19 and makes something work which is obviously the story everyone wants to read about. Yeah, I mean... Maybe be, but it's probably less realistic. The great thing about my time at HelloFresh was that they allowed me to make... Like, they gave me a lot of responsibility and they allowed me to make a lot of mistakes, but they kind of um, would overlook those as long as I had the right attitude and the right hunger and that I was trying to make things happen. And, um, you know, I I was terrible at hiring (laughs) throughout my six years and, you know, time Mm. and time again got that wrong and... Um, just been chatting to a like young founder today actually and he you know he's sort of trying to grow and he's hired a couple of people and they're all wrong and he's had to get rid of them and I was like the amount of time I'm terrible at hiring I don't know what I'm doing yeah but the the time that costs you and the you know that is that's really and it's actually one of those skills that um, it's really hard to like do unless you start 
doing more and more of it and you make those mistakes and then you're mm. like okay well why did i make that mistake with that person and what can what would i do differently and how should i think about this and you're never going to be perfect at it but you can get a lot better at it and it's actually a skill that is probably as a founder when you start scaling quickly like being able to hire good people and bring them on the journey is probably one of the most important things you're gonna you're gonna kind of do um, yeah definitely feels like the single biggest challenge for me I mean it's something I moan about every day to fortunate now to have kind of mentor slash investors that help me a lot but yes it's, it's, it's so hard because I've always felt like obviously when you start you do everything yourself but then it's like do I hire to grow or do I hire once I've grown it's kind of that debate in my head and it's a little bit different now because I have more funding and stuff but yeah definitely something I need to need to work on yeah I mean I, I'm a big believer in trying to keep things as lean as possible and only hiring when you you really feel you kind of need it um mm. my team would say that that puts them under quite a lot of pressure sometimes because we're slightly always behind the curve but i think one of my big things in d2c is um you know a lot of the a lot of where people go wrong i think is they hire far too many people far too early and and the advantage of the d2c model is you can be incredibly lean or on air like full-time headcount basis you can be incredibly lean you can use mm. a lot of outsourced partners that you can dial up and down depending on how your performance is going a lot of um you know freelancers etc and you can you can really manage that risk with the um with the ups and downs of your business and before you know a lot of people you see successful consumer businesses they go and raise like 10 million and they're like they're doing you know the businesses that are doing like five million in revenue and they've got teams of like 50 60 people yeah. and you're just like you know revenue per head's tiny what you know, what are they all doing and like you just you don't like d2c isn't that complicated like you should in my view um you know why would you have your own tech team and in-house tech team because you know everything for our types of products are like pretty much you know they're all out there they've all been made and there yeah. are people much better at making them than than we are so don't try and reinvent the wheel on that um and then yeah so um, i mean i suppose one of the interesting things we look at wild one of the big inspirations was a company called native um don't yeah. Know if, yeah yeah i've you, read a lot about them yeah Moise Ali, yeah yes yeah, so he's he, he when he sold to png he had eight full-time people and he was like uh, two years old, right? Two and a half years old. He was, do. he was doing 30 million in revenue, mm. eight full-time people, a million, uh, million a month in EBITDA. Um, Crazy. And, um, you know, you kind of look at that and you're like, I basically wake up every morning and go, well, we're not doing as well as Moses yeah. do, it was doing. And so like, you know, he had half the team, half the resources and was doing, you know, more revenue and he didn't need all this funding. And I, 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 I think it's amazing when you dig into people like that and companies like that how they how they've built and if you look back at the last 10 15 years of d2c now you see that most of the like really successful companies like genuinely successful companies have been um very lean and very financially consciously run and a lot of these like big ones that you would think of warby parker um harry's casper all birds they've all just been like flush with cash manscaped mm, rings a bell as well that one. massively over those 300 mil or something Crazy. massively over over built their teams yeah. and i think manscaped didn't lose i think that was actually uh i think manscaped is is it, it does make money but they had a um stock compensation thing that m means their f their first year as right. a public company makes them look like they okay. lost 300 yeah. million yeah, yeah. um because i'm not sure uh, you know they would um they would get away with that but yeah it's like it's super interesting so st starting wild then like was that a case of i mean for me certainly starting money brand it was literally i went back to the drawing board and sat with a blank piece of paper and thought what am i going to do next which is why i mentioned at one point i considered doing something similar to wild but it just the passion for me wasn't there where did that come about for you is it like did you just look at an opportunity and think well i know to run a dt brand what what ticks certain boxes or was it more opportunistic um yeah so 
just for the listeners, Wild's mission is to remove single-use plastic and create high-performing natural products um, for your everyday personal care routines. And we started by launching a refillable deer. You get like an aluminium case and then biodegradable bamboo bamboo pulp refills. Um, so, and and I'm a co-founder. My co-founder Charlie and I started the business um, in kind of mid 2019 as an MVP, and then properly in 2020. Um, we, you know, I. Once I decided I was going to leave um, HelloFresh, I went and met a whole load of founders and interviewed for head of growth or CMO type roles. And I wasn't that impressed by their caliber. And I certainly didn't want to take instructions from any of them. Um, Mm. And none of them really understood. Like, I don't don't think any of them would have hired me anyway because they they didn't really understand the space um, in the way, or they didn't look at it in the way I I thought about it. So that quickly came to the conclusion, well, I can't work for any of these people, so I'm going to have to start my own business. Charlie at the time um, was doing a little side hustle, was um, running a business called Climate Cups, which is like reusable coffee cups online. Um, And, you know, we'd go over to his house at the weekend and, slowly you know be packing more and more boxes and and doing quite well and um you know what we kind of picked up from that experience was these kind of brands in the sustainability space um were very well catered for social um growth um just in the way that people are looking to like share comment and interact with those kind of brands and that sustainability is like a macro consumer um trend that that is only going in one direction and there's only going to be more demand and that large companies are inherently like really badly set up to um to be able to move at the pace that um consumers are going to want and um you know we we need to do so we 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 quickly were like okay we want to play somewhere in the in the sustainability landscape we want a brand that is like future proof and that is going to um, you know, do in some small way, you know, make a difference, but also felt like a lot of the brands out there were very like patronizing and um, forceful with their messaging and kind mm. of save the world kind of stuff. And that that was not where we wanted to play. We just like, we think we can do something, but just like have a bit more fun with it and make it a bit more lighthearted and kind of inspire people to make small changes rather than kind of force them but initially we sat down in a pizza express and similar like we're like oh well why don't we do sustainable fashion um and then i was like there's only one person that dresses worse than me in the world and that was charlie my (laughs) co-founder i was like we we literally cannot do fashion like it's not gonna it's not gonna work and you know quickly you come to the like you're looking at where people are using products on a regular basis and where there's a a lot of plastic and a lot of opportunity in the bathroom was quite kind of obvious to us. And we originally started and we're like, okay, maybe shower gel and then came across native and we're like, um, actually deodorant um, from a differentiation perspective and a like way into people's bathrooms is is, is much more interesting than mm. shower gel was at the time. Um, so that's kind of how we landed on, on natural deo and, we we didn't we kind of said okay what we're going to do we're going to um, boot we're going to bootstrap and um, do an MVP we're going to buy some natural do like off the shelf basically package it up brand it and sell it on a Shopify site and just see mm. whether it it kind of works um, and um, what we learned there is like the 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 demand was there and it you could make the numbers work um but we had like the worst natural deodorant um you could imagine yeah. um so we had to like cut that quite quite short um but we had at least a a, a kind of validation that we could if if we figured out how to create a good product in this space there was going to be an opportunity we didn't know how big that opportunity was going to be like natural deos as a category was like one to two million in the uk total like sales Mm. um so you know when we first met every vc they all said yeah like this is ridiculously niche this is never going to work um and um but we managed to raise like similar to you we kind of um got together an angel an angel round and raised kind of half a million how um, much proof of concept had you had up to that point sorry in terms of like sales and stuff so we've done about 100 grand of sales 
Um, oh yeah, uh, is that like Facebook ads? Facebook ads, yeah. yeah. In terms of actually met sourcing the product though, like where were you making that? Was it like a garage job or was it? did you actually have a proper manufacturing? Um, and you, we, how much money did you put into that for a start? It, 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 it was like a bad experience basically mm. um, where I thought like, how hard can it be? I'm like, you know, deodorant, you know, must be loads of people, but basically sticks deodorants don't really kind of happen and everyone was telling me like nine to 12 months before they could get us a product if you wanted yeah. to make your own product I was like I don't have nine to 12 months this is ridiculous mm. um like how can it take that long and I was just a bit naive coming into the cosmetics world I'd, there's like a lot of regulation and there's a lot of process and, and and a lot of these like manufacturers just move incredibly slowly yeah anyway you know after a couple of weeks of like not getting anywhere I managed to get through to this kind of company who said yeah we know what you want we can do it for you um and you know I, I, they just the, yeah the, they weren't the the best they weren't weren't great people to work with and um ended up causing us a lot of problems but in you know we got we had some products we shipped it out and we proved the concept and we you know the main thing we wanted to understand is what 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 is going to be the cost of acquiring a customer and what is the like what is a customer going to come and mm. buy what you know what are they willing to pay for this product um, yeah. and we got those dynamics and we were like we we're pretty happy with those numbers um and we really thought if we could find a way to as i said get that product right then we could um we could grow it yeah cause I, I saw some pictures of the original one it was, was it like a paper circular tube wasn't it it was a bit more kind of b-tech version of what you've now got which is a, a lot glossier because like i was saying i bought it like 18 months ago and yeah it's cool is that something that so so you go go back you get a proof of concept 100 grand in sales all that what was the time period between that and then raising the money and then relaunching effectively is so, that how you did it or were you constantly selling um we we had to stop selling because we just we we um we actually found out they one of the biggest mistakes that no one should ever make is don't have your manufacturer and your 3pl as the same thing because then you have no visibility of where the stock is and how much stock they had so they were telling us they were sending mm. the stock out but they weren't so they were like clicking fulfilled but they just so for a month they didn't send any orders out yeah. um so it's like some bad stuff like that that just you know really good lessons to learn and you know i did some it, but I, I, we made a lot of mistakes and i was pretty naive from an operational perspective um in those early early kind of months but it was kind of a six month process so we we launched that in kind of august we were out raising um and we ended up closing in kind of late jan we, we'd stopped the mvp by the beginning of the year and then we had this kind of horrible wait where we weren't selling and we had to wait for the new product to kind of land and that landed mm. in like april um april 2020 as the world went into lockdown yeah perfect timing arguably yeah um the covid boom that's certainly something i experienced it, it, in 2020 it, well we launched we launched like the day it all happened so we never had anything we never had any view of what world would have been like before that yeah but it, you know those first few months when you look back on them were just insane you know two two pound cacks um yeah jesus christ uh, uh, and I get that now. You, you, you know well, it, it, it was um it was just a glorious time to be um to be a d2c business mm. um but i think you know again a lot of businesses in a funny way it, it it's done more harm than good because a lot of people have built that infrastructure and built that growth curve and and then as demand has dropped off and CACs have risen it's like it's created some like hard realities to oh to, yeah to kind of face definitely I was, I was one of those people in a way I mean that went to shit for, for supply chain reason more than yeah I mean the rest is history but yeah I guess at the start of 2020 mid 2020 I felt pretty invincible spending like a million a month on Instagram laughing and then yeah later part of the year kind of reality check and it definitely feels different having launched my brand in the past three months I mean it still works but I was very conscious about you know this needs to be a subscription business with a big LTV to work I think in, in like 2022 and beyond so yeah I guess I learned in that respect in terms of raising the money do you think because so many people have asked me off the back of 
so I kind of publicly documented a bit of like the building in public process because it took me, I basically came up with this idea in November 21 and then it took me five months to, you know, get the money together and make it happen basically to launch it and then obviously launched nearly four months ago. Did you find that, that fundraising process was largely reliant on like y- your experience previously? Because so many people ask me like, oh, like how did you raise money? I mean, for me it was off mates and angels. I didn't go to like, any funds or anything. Because fortunately I had a good network, but how was that for you? Yeah, so um, yeah, I was lucky um, that you had a bit of a, a network from Hello Fresh mm. and some of those guys had done quite well. Um, and then a few people who I'd been, um, so I did some kind of freelancing between the two and, um, you know, again, met some like interesting people who um, were just kind of involved in the startup space. And we, um, but it was hard work. It took us like, took us six months to to raise um no funds were interested at all um and you know we we were lucky like a a lot of it came through introductions and um and and you know you find one and then they recommend you to another but we we had a stage where we had 500k committed you know probably let's say two months into the process we had one big angel and then a um a small VC fund and they said the big angel was going to do 250 and the, um, and the fund were going to do 250 and then the fund pulled out at the last minute. And then the mm. big angel was like, well, why have they pulled out? I'm pulling out as well. So we, we literally went from having the money pretty much all done to back to zero. Yeah. And then we just ground it out. A lot of people like 10 K 20, you know, it's kind of, um, and we, we kind of tried to avoid, you know, we didn't really want to get too many friends involved because we weren't like, we just didn't really want to lose our friends money. And mm. we thought it was like pretty high risk. So we, we, we tried to find, um, you know, people within the, the ecosystem and, um, yeah, it's when your network, when you, you've been in the space for six years and you know, the fa- like a lot of the founders and then you go to them and like, you know, a lot of them are like nice and they'll introduce you to people who, were angels and yeah. then the angel world is actually quite small and you know there are little pockets of people who all invest together and once you find a couple of those then you get a bit of momentum yeah yeah definitely that's kind of what i found as well but it's, I, I it's had, a slog and luck right it's, yeah i was gonna say i had two two investors of mine now i met through the pod so one of them quite literally invested the next day there you go so and now he's yeah a, a great friend and mentor of mine as well so the pod pays off in other ways, I guess, this little passion project. So so I think one thing a lot of people are interested in, and it's the stage I'm kind of at, and I'm still trying to figure it out, which I mentioned before we start recording, is like, so you got that money, you obviously have experience scaling a business. Like, how did that look in the first few months in terms of like, physically your setup? Were you working from home, like I am currently, and hating it, because I'm so sick of it? Like, what was the team like? Obviously you mentioned, you think, D to C can be very lean. I guess, yeah, in many ways, how did it look kind of first three to six months? Yeah, so there were four of us. Um, we had a tiny office in, in Vauxhall. Um, again, just thought it was important to um, have somewhere. Um, you know, you're making so many decisions and you're also, you're building the culture subconsciously. Mm. You don't even realise it, but you're building that culture in those first few months. Yeah. Um, but... Um, I kind of lie a little bit because obviously um, COVID happened and everything went, we did have a small office, but it, it went remote pretty quickly. So we mm. ended up moving to being a remote company for, for most of COVID. Um, but yeah, we had four people. One guy who worked for me at Hello Fresh was like, called me up and was like, I'm moving back from Dublin. I'm, you know, I want to like a new sales role. Um, and I was like, well, I've heard there's this really great deodorant startup <laughs> that you should definitely, um, you could, you should, you should join. And, um, so that was, that was our first hire a guy called Harry and, um, just someone we'd worked together for six months. He worked for me at Hello Fresh as a, an intern and just someone I knew we could rely on and he would, he was up for anything and just yeah. like, um, 
you know, someone, someone just super, he would do customer service tickets. He'd go out selling. He would, you know, take, take to anything and just help us get it off the ground. And, um, yeah, he's been, he's basically been a third co-founder for us. Um, and then Emily, um, who again was just a grad, um, just brilliant attitude, you know, um, she's now doing a, you know, amazing job for us running, um, kind of brand and marketing and, um, she just, she did like, again, customer service, emails, social media, etc., and, and, and we kind of built from there. Yeah. I, th- I think you need everyone to be willing to get their hands dirty, which is probably why I'm terrible at hiring. Cause I assume that people that come in might not understand that, you know, maybe they come from a bigger company. Cause I did hire a few people previously, like PAY employees in the past and it didn't end very well. Cause I was overpaying them and didn't know how to manage people at all, basically. Um, and I think part of the problem was they came from bigger companies. Suddenly there's like five people and a bunch of outsourced customer service agents in the Philippines at the time. Yeah. And yeah, it's just a bit of a culture shock because a startup is chaos, as you know, but a lot it, of people just aren't used to that. It's, it's total chaos and, and like it's a very set type of person who is going to enjoy that and like thrive in it and want to be in the trenches with you um yeah. and probably they have limited experience so they don't really like they never learn anything else and that, that was certainly my experience at HelloFresh like I never knew anything else and I was like young in my 20s and I was just like desperate to learn and just wanted to get stuck in and mm. try and you know I was so eager to try and please and do whatever and and I think um you know experience counts for nothing in those early months because what you're going it's kind of more like a roller coaster where you've no idea what's coming the next day and all all you've got to be as a team is like super reactive ready to like pivot or adapt or kind of fight the next fire Mm. that 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 kind of comes at you um and you know i think naivety actually a lot of the time is better because you don't have any preconceptions of who your customer is or what your product should be or and and the whole way of learning and developing is you know really being close to your customer and then kind of figuring out everything that goes around that but but putting them at the center of of how you build your your company yeah and how quick did you think well did you think this is going well i mean you said you're getting two pound cacks which is pretty good (laughs) i've never seen that before yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was good. Like it was good, but I was in charge of operations. So I didn't have much of the, um, like pleasure of, uh, low marketing cash. Yeah. I was just getting abuse for not ordering enough stock. Yeah. Uh, and, and COVID was great for marketing, but it was really tough for supply chain. How many SKUs did you launch with? Um, so we had about three, so we had like three cases and then five fragrances. So it's, um, I suppose eight, eight products um in total yeah um but and and again one of the things i'd kind of learn is like keeping it simple is just you know to begin with if you if your if your product's going to work it's going to work with a with with a small amount of choice and then you can choice will build growth but it, yeah you know having loads of choice to begin with um again if you look at the recipe box companies they all started and you got three meals and you didn't choose and that was enough to get them to like 10 million Mm. um and then they needed to so we were lucky we kept it pretty simple it was one product you know and i i i think we're on like the fifth iteration of the do now so we we kind of we never went in with that concept of like this is our final product and we you know this is what it is it's like okay again what we what you learn in a food business was like um we, we would learn about what, what people liked, what their preferences are, how they, you know, what time they wanted to cook, what meats they liked, what, you know, and it turned out HelloFresh was basically how to cook a chicken breast a hundred different ways. Yeah. Um, but that's what people wanted. Mm. Um, and we used data and insights. And, you know, one of the reasons the recipe box companies that have been successful, the founders aren't that foodie. They're, they're more like data mm. driven, like, methodical thinkers so they never put themselves then a lot of businesses are like well i'm the customer so i'm going to create the product the way i would like it whereas i think being able to remove yourself from that and be like i'm not the customer but i'm objectively 
understanding what our customer wants mm. is incredibly powerful. Do you think you were a customer right at the start? Because certainly the way I built the first product was I, I literally made it for me. And I guess now I'm learning what people actually want, which is kind of what I've made, but different versions. But how was that for you? Like, were you a user of the product or were you literally like, this is an opportunity? We no, we, we we users like I uh, I've worn more deodorants than you can imagine. Yeah. You know, I, I I test it, but ultimately, Wild is a female brand. Like mm -hmm. it's a female market, um, so men are, are much less attuned to what we're trying to do. Um, so I've had to be objective, and I've had to use you know people around me who I I think are in our customer groups and and use those to to drive early feedback. Yeah, and in terms of like initial scale, how are you growing? Because for me, it's Instagram and TikTok ads. What's ninety percent Instagram? To be fair, yeah, still it was, was it just, just that, that was it. Yeah, that was all you needed to do in COVID. Just yeah. flick on Facebook and just sit back and relax. As my yeah. Charlie, my co-founder, the easiest job in the world. Um, so you know, it's got it's got tougher since then. But um, yeah, to begin with, it was all it was all social, paid social, and TikTok didn't exist. So it wasn't yeah, even true. wasn't even an op at all. Right. That's, that's, that's changed very rapidly. Yeah, yeah, changed changed pretty quickly. So, like first year twenty twenty, get to the end of twenty twenty. How did that look in terms of team size, like scale relatively to where you were at the start? So, I think we were like ten, maybe ten people by the end of the year. Mm. Of like maybe a little less, eight people. We raised two million at the end of that year. Um, so yeah. off the back of COVID numbers, we, um, yeah, we, 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 we did a like 2 million raise with, um, kind of small venture. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, I think you, you're talking like, um, sort of five, 600 K a month type, type revenues, I suppose, by the yeah. end, by the end of that first, first year. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm trying to do, basically. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to make sense. In terms of fundraising, because this is, again, it's a question I get so much and something I'm more in tune with now, having done it, the, the first bit of it, and kind of having a rough roadmap for what I might try and do. Like, in your mind, what was the primary logic for that? Was it to, was it because you needed to? Or was it because you wanted to grow quicker and potentially you know, position it to raise money at a bigger valuation in the future? Because everyone says to me, why are you raising money? Why, why why don't you just be profitable? And it's like, well, actually, we're pretty much break even already, to be fair. But obviously, more money, I guess, just means you can go a bit quicker. That's my logic at this stage, at least. So slightly different for Wild, where um, when you create a bespoke product like we had done, um, the unit economics, because you're doing it, or look, you're the only people making that and buying mm. it, um, they don't really stack up. So scale is absolutely critical to getting your margin profile to work. Otherwise, you have to charge a way higher price for yeah. the product. So for us, it was like it was quite obvious that it needed to get to a certain scale for it to be like a, a brand that um, you know could deliver both the size we wanted to build it into and the size. Um, and, and the price point that we thought we needed to do to, to kind of build that. So, and our margins were like, they started really low and they've, what scale has enabled us to do is really um, become a lot more kind of efficient. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, we, we probably more than halved our costs now. Um, so I think for us, there was a very clear reason to raise that money to get to that scale, to then drive, the, the overall health of the business um i would say like we we never intended our hope was you know ultimately again when i look back i was like well moa's ali managed to do it off 500k mm. and he owned 90 percent of the business you know even if you sell for 10 million let's say that's you're still going to be okay um he sold for 100 million so take 90 million away so i'm i'm like a big believer that you um if possible, you, you shouldn't need loads of cap. Like, try and try and avoid taking loads of capital on board, and um, particularly, again, to like hire big teams before you've got the revenue to mm. to like fund fund that yourself. I think that's when when you're like building the team for like 
18 months time revenue then you've got to be like well that's a, that's a big risk um yeah. so for us it, and and then you know we we're really like growth that was all about grow help us grow you know the unit economics work with a subscription business as you'll know if you put more money in and your cac's cac's going to increase over time that's just the nature mm. of it um you've still you're going to get a payback window and so that's when they become relatively cash hungry as as kind of businesses and you'll need a bit of capital to support that yeah you know payback window where, wherever it is yeah i mean my plan and i've already taken out a bit of it so i've worked away flyer before i mean i think you have as well yeah, have you? yeah. i mean loads of brands do you obviously got solutions like pipe as well now for subscription businesses my logic was initially i wanted to I actually wanted to raise money because I wanted to get experience on board because I knew where I fucked up last time. So now I feel like it's a win-win. I've been given capital to have people that are financially invested and emotionally invested because they know me and it puts pressure on my back, which is a good thing because I think I need that because in the past I'd chopped and changed between different brands I'd built online. Now it's like, all right, cool. I need to focus for three to five years to actually achieve what I want to achieve. But yeah, I do agree because I think I probably could have raised a little bit more money but then it's kind of like you start looking at the cap table and thinking well I'm already chopping off a big chunk here and it's like where's where's that balance I suppose it, yeah and I think for listeners like it's definitely not a sign of success raising money yeah. and, and some of the least successful businesses I know in the D to C space have raised the most amount of money hmm. um, and a lot of people you think are super successful because they've raised all this money are like they're in all sorts of problems right now because the markets like come back to 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 kind of normal mm. and there were, you know last year there was crazy amounts of money running around there were huge valuations and it was really tempting to like go and play that game um and um you know to we i was quite cautious and was like i really wouldn't want to go and raise 10 20 million at like let's say a 7 8x revenue kind of multiple and then mm. have to you know if you do the numbers to like think about how you're going to make everyone happy with an exit um you have to like knock the lights out continually for like yeah. 5 years in a row and even then even then it's like it's kind of hard so you know, for us, definitely we're ambitious. We back ourselves. But I try and look at everything of like, ultimately, you know, I want to build a business that hopefully if we do a decent job, everyone will go away and be like, they'll, 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 they'll be relatively happy. Mm. Um, and when things are like, you're overhyped or you're, you know, people are, pushing too much money around i think you've you know actually being disciplined and um trying not to get too involved in that um and and i think as you grow as a dc business becoming financially responsible is is like a core part of of being successful mm. um and yeah as a, like a you know a lot of companies now have got really high burn rates and they're totally reliant on that next round and suddenly the the herd mentality has changed the view on consumer companies from you know peak covid everyone thinking it's the future to now everyone saying well dc's like is dead and, and neither of those points are true like there's something like the the it'll end up somewhere in the middle um but you know you've got to be careful that the winds can change quite quickly. And and I suppose I'd seen that at HelloFresh. There have been moments where we were like the future of food. And mm. this was like the most incredible thing and like incredible growth. And then there were times where everyone was like, recipe boxes are never going to work. These are terrible businesses. They're never going to work. Um, and ultimately, you know, when you look at that over a seven, eight year period, you you kind of realise that um, those ex both of those extremes, you know, they net out in the end. But um, you, you don't want to be 
you know, it's like playing musical chairs and the music stops and like, there's not, there's not many chairs at the moment. So it's, um, mm. it, it's, it's a bit of a rough game if you, if you're dependent on that cash. I think the best thing is with, with you, if you're like break even and you're just using the capital to grow, but that's discretionary marketing spend, you know, that you can pull back if it, if, if you, if you want to, and you can use Wayflower and things to, to keep you going. I think that's good. And, and, and for me, you know, not having too much money. So I have to think about the bottom line and always like pushing towards profitability. You know, the biggest thing we can do this year at Wild is, 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 is because starts to become profitable. And that, you know, I've been really clear with everyone about mm. that. And if that means that we have to pull back some of our growth, I was like, I'm really, before all of this has got as bad as it has, really, really believe. Yeah, a lot of people are telling me that. Like, I, I, I really want Wild to be able to generate, um, you know, show that it can generate some money. Yeah. One of my other investors and mates, a guy called James Hill, he sold his business, Hairburst, to JD Group back in December. And yeah, he's just drilled that into me, profitability, because they were always profitable from 2013 up until yeah. now. And that's why they got a very big exit. Um, whereas, it's funny, I, I speak to, Alex, who sold a business called Content Cow, which is a SaaS business, he needs a bit more. Oh, that needs to be profitable. We just need to grow the grow the subscriber base. Yeah, but D to C isn't yeah. SaaS, yeah. and that's the that's the big thing. Like SaaS, but it feels kind of somewhere in between with the subscription offering, I guess, to an extent. Well, that's more. What, that's what people have thought, but subscription D to C subscription businesses rarely scale in a way. In in the they're more finite than mm. SaaS businesses. Yeah. And, you know, SaaS businesses and like what you, what you, if you look at most D to C subscriptions, so Graze is one of the like most extreme examples, right? So yeah. they built a D to C subscription business to 60 million in um, five, six years. Um, I think that business is basically dead now, but they, they'd gone through six, seven million customers. Everyone had tried to freeze mm. Graze box and, the churn eventually caught up with them and yeah. they, they, they couldn't build it. So I think whereas SaaS businesses, you know, a lot of those customers, you know, don't churn and they, they they're very high value yeah. and you don't need, you don't need millions of them to like generate that revenue at scale. These DTC businesses, you know, subscription businesses, if, if they're going to get SaaS multiples, they need to like, they need to have incredible retention mm. and that is that's super hard yeah i'm only just starting to see kind of realistic i guess three and a bit months i probably need six months to really tell but yeah it is interesting because i'm already thinking kind of oh i thought we had more subscribers than we did obviously a certain chunk of them it's about 25 percent churn so far that's, but that's pretty good is that yeah that's pretty good i mean i you, haven't done anything to kind of improve retention at all yet. It's just like the website's shit. We don't have any follow up theme <laughs> kind of stuff and people are canceling. So it seems all right because the product reviews have been good, which is obviously the most critical thing ultimately. One thing on like profitability and subscription, etc. I noticed you are in retail or in, is it Tesco or Sainsbury's? Uh, Sainsbury's, yeah. Yeah, because that's something, again, I've been advised to look at and I, I have been speaking to a few retailers that emailed me I mean, I, I've never done it before. I'd probably get screwed on everything if I was to jump into it blindly. But how much of the business is that for you, if you can say? Or is, is it, I would imagine it's not as big as D to C. It's a small percentage at the moment, but... Do you I, see that growing? Yeah, I do, yeah. And I think um, I, I think one of the, the best things about D C is you can learn your customer, you can craft your product, you can improve everything about it. Mm. But ultimately, let's say deodorant, which is the category I'm in at the moment, like 90% of people buy their deodorant in the supermarket as part of their, you know, yeah. month, monthly shop. And I really do buy that, like not everyone's going to want to come to like every different D to C branded site and have all these different customer journeys um, buying all these products that say like HelloFresh, Harry's, Wild, 
pack coffee you know there probably is a point where you're like you can't you can't expect consumers to manage 20 subscriptions for you know that they they're, they're they're like more going to congregate around amazon and um um and other uh, you know and 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 offline retail where they're they're already kind of buying this and and that like specifically for like basic commodity products which which we fit into um so my view is d2c is a phenomenal way to build a brand in a very cash efficient way Mm. and um a lot of people are like well the margin so you get lower margin in retail so why would you do that but i think they make the mistake of looking at a contrib at the wrong level of contribution margin so you know for us my view is you either pay your taxes to facebook and google or you pay your taxes mm. to sainsbury's and yeah. if you if you if you look at the bottom line after mm. acquisition costs where you end up it's probably more profitable to do retail than it is to do DTC. that's what i'm starting to think yeah. yeah and you can and they can work together and you can do cool stuff that makes people feel exclusive and you definitely your best customers are always going to want to buy directly from you and you can look and nurture them but some of the ones are like yeah i like well but like can i really be bothered to remember to like log go on and log in and manage Mm. my subscription just to get my deodorant you know probably not but if it's just there in sainsbury's as part of my you know usual pickup of deodorant then i'm i'm gonna buy it um and my vision for wild is we should be available wherever anyone wants to buy us and I don't care where people buy us. Yeah. What the fuck is this? Space Goods, spacegoods.com, Rainbow Dust version one. My newest entrepreneurial econ brand venture. I spent six months in the trenches building this shit from scratch. We launched six weeks ago. What's it all about? The next generation wellness brand with a long-term vision to essentially consumerize the pending psychedelic consumer goods market, which might sound absolutely ridiculous. We're not quite there yet. The market's massively illegal. But what is this? Rainbow Dust version one is an all-in-one mushroom and adaptogenic blend designed to unlock your supernatural self. Essentially, experience a sharper focus, sustained energy, zen like calm throughout the day. It's an all-in-one powder. Tastes like fucking hot chocolate. Tastes delicious. Works great. Looks great. Feels amazing. Essentially, the broader concept here was to legally imitate a psychedelic microdose and like I said, experience those symptoms. You can mix it with anything. Brand brownies, bake brownies with it, mix it with your coffee, have it without coffee, replace your coffee, put it into a protein shake. It's super fucking versatile. It tastes great. It replaced the stack of supplements I was previously taking, but you need to try this shit. It would definitely change the way you work, get you into that deep workflow. I obviously think that myself, plenty of a thousand plus first customers think the exact same shit. It's not just a pretty packaging. It actually works really fucking well. Keto, vegan, all that good shit. Trust me, you need to try it for yourself. Let's scale the shit to the moon. Spacegoods.com. Get on your Rainbow Dust subscription and see how you fucking feel. Let's do it for the boys. Spacegoods.com. Yeah, I think my approach now well, what I'm trying to do, and again, like I said, the advice I've had is probably just to diversify a bit. Like I'm launching on Amazon next week, which is only four months in. I think it's probably worth trying. I've never done it before. It feels, you know, when it, when Instagram accounts can get disabled, like mine did twice in the first month, it's just kind of a, like that was pretty unusual. And it's kind of, I hope is resolved for the long term. But I just think, yeah, having retail, other channels, not being reliant on any single channel, whether that's sales or ads, basically. That seems to make sense. That's what I think. And it, it's about de-risking and, you know, just building your business. Like we've all learned building a business purely on Facebook ads is like probably not a very like fun place to be right now. Um, but, it, you know, it goes for every channel and the the channels are always changing and developing and you're always going to have one channel that you're, you're you, you know, that's your best and is going well. But I, I, I think the more you can have a diversified mix and you can have different, you know when you look when i look ahead you know it's like what levers have i got to pull for growth and if it's just like put more money into this narrow bucket and hope for Mm. the best or like well i've got these three buckets and this is performing best right now so let's let's go for that over that then that that's kind of helpful i i do think you know my view is slightly you know i would probably say three months in you're going well don't don't take your energy away from you know if your CACs are good things are looking good I would I would be going all in on D2C right now if I was you and I would I think for the first year 
keep your product simple, keep your proposition simple. And if you're growing and you're happy with that and you're around break even, like just do everything you can to like make the most of that moment and build those direct relationships. So for us, it was kind mm. of 12 months before we went into to Sainsbury's and then, you know, we're not even on Amazon yet, but I think we, you know, we will kind of get there. And, and I think one of the challenges you'll find is like, there are so many things as a founder that can like drag you in when you're a lean team and there's, you know, there's only so much you can do. Um, the other thing with something like Amazon is you've just got to make sure your operations are like they're running really well because D to C is a bit more forgiving. You can control, mm. you know, the, the narrative there, but if you outstock or you run into problems, which you're probably going to do in your first year, most D to C startups who are doing better than they expect will, um, you know, you can really damage your reputation on these platforms and it's a yeah. lot harder to come back. So I'm I'm a little bit long term, completely aligned, diversify, de risk, be have many different options for, for growth. International is very underestimated as well. Um you know the, the if you're just in the UK and again we saw this, it's like um at some point if you're doing well you're in the UK market, someone is going to come and do something very similar to you because they're going to be like, hey, they're mm. really successful. I quite like this space. I'm going to, you know, similar to like you were thinking about vegan products in the bathroom. You know, there'll be other people thinking about um, what you want to do. And for me, that's where if you're, if you, if you're you not stuck in one market um, and you have a couple of markets that are working well, some competitors is coming at you in the UK and they're, you know, it's a bit of a dogfight. You've got other areas of the the world that you can push that spend and not get too reliant on having to just win this one market. And that that was a big thing I learned at HelloFresh, right? We were in 10 markets by the time I left. And if you look at the six years I was there, every year one market would would would, would be having a shocker. It, like, and it would change every year. And, you know, mm. and, and what they were able to do is there were also markets that were like, would find growth hacks or like uh, channels or things that would suddenly start working for them. And, you know, what saved us a number of times was that there was enough markets to like overall get that performance up and not just be reliant on one market or one competitor. Yeah, I'm very bullish on the EU now because there's quite a lot of, very big brands in my space in America, like Mudwater, Everyday Dose. There's not many in the UK, at least not good ones in my opinion. Um, the EU, there's barely any. So like Germany, the CPA is a third of the UK and that's without localizing anything. Yeah. Obviously the slight problem is it's kind of complicated to ship into the EU right now, which I'm finding a lot of delays at customs and the odd one star review coming in, but that can be fixed. So You, you, you can fix that. Yeah. And, and, and again, people are like, they're super everyone thinks like you have to have this perfect website and this perfect mm. customer experience it's like facebook is this brilliant tool where you can just turn on english ads turn them on in europe and let it optimize for which country it goes through and as you say you know a couple of parcels don't make it there it's not you know a couple of customers aren't super happy a few things with customs a lot harder after brexit but just kind of at least trying it and seeing what happens and understanding what those CPAs are. And you see Germany, you know, that's quite rare, by the way, like Germany typically is a much higher CPA market than in, in D to C. Um, but, um, you know, it's still, and, and, and these markets are harder, but for us, we, we saw enough potential and we're like, okay, we, if we do X, Y, and Z and we get the language and we, you know, put get fulfillment center in europe and figure all these things out then we can we can start to build something that's much harder to rep like i think our european businesses are much prouder of because it's been a lot harder to do mm. than our uk business which has like been relatively straightforward have you up. just localized the website and fulfillment then basically yeah yeah and at what scale because that's already something i'm thinking uh, this probably makes sense definitely for europe broadly you know just moving to a fulfillment center in amsterdam which I use James and James, little plug, um, which are way too expensive, but they have the network already there and I've used them in the past. Um, like, at what scale did you do that? So was we, it just when you saw a proof of concept in another country? 
no we like again you know um st stock stock management if you're growing fast multiple warehouses particularly the way our product is set up mm. it causes a lot of headaches so yeah. you want to avoid it as long as possible and you can ship really cost effectively from the uk into europe and you can can figure it out um so you know for us w we had more than proof of concept they were like quite substantial markets so like definitely north of you know 100 grand a month in revenue before mm. we were like okay we need to yeah we need to kind of it made sense to like go and set up that operation in europe and and have a fulfillment center there yeah definitely definitely be way too much hassle right now and like you said just focusing on what works it's kind of the 80 20 rule with everything isn't it particularly at the start just like a lot of people overcomplicate things and and they're like you know as an entrepreneur you you you, you don't want to let your customers down and you want it to be perfect but sometimes as you say like if it's 80 percent good enough and you know that when it becomes a meaningful part of the business you're going to make get it to 100 percent mm. you should you should go for it but you know who knows like what can happen in the uk and like they could change the laws or they could you know or you could have a like bad press thing or you know all these things can happen and if you have a couple of different countries where you can navigate through that crisis you can kind of take pressure off that market and and figure stuff out and and have other markets where you know germans aren't reading what's going on in the uk um that will make you more resilient longer term and it costs like wild has been in the uk like a profitable business probably for the last 18 months and we've had to subsidize europe right. um, because yeah. it's been more expensive for us there's been bigger problems but i've really thought that like long term if we want to be the business that we set out to be we, we, we have to crack more than the uk so europe has to be something that we persevere with and 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 that's beginning to pay off now yeah do you have uh, and did you have a specific goal of where you wanted to get to right at the start and, and how has that changed if it has changed because <laughs> um, certainly for me like, i feel like my goal was probably bigger at the start and then i think fuck me this is hard isn't it um only three only three months in I think ours was more modest actually we were like look we could build like a 10 million pound business mm. um and not raise too much money and you know and and kind of um but I, I didn't overthink it you know I, I I didn't have this big like um you know again neither way like I wasn't like I'm going to build a billion dollar business and like, yeah. I'm going to go and, you know it's good to say that yeah it does sound good but I, I honestly I've seen the sacrifices that it requires to do that and the, the guys at HelloFresh who were at the top you know that it's like incredible the the amount that they have had to give to building that business and for me it was like um you know i was i was a dad just became a dad when i started so it, it it was more like i want something where i'm gonna learn you know i'm gonna learn if i'm good enough i'm gonna learn if i can run my own business and then it has to work for the life i want as well as you know um growing 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 the company so like a balanced mm. um you know a more balanced approach maybe than 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 i had in my 20s where at hello fresh i was like in my 20s and just going for it and and I, you know there was not much else going on so i could do that um so yeah th i think for us i now kind of um you know we we, we built hello fresh to being 100 million in the uk and and profitable by the time i left and that's like that's the benchmark now in six years i'd mm. love to beat that that's like what i say now just in the uk or worldwide 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 yeah, yeah. that'll do wouldn't it you mentioned the sacrifices to get to like that, that billion level what are they because you've seen them firsthand and and how do you th and how and why do you think that differs to you know only getting to say you know 10 20 million which is statistically much more achievable i just think as a founder you know the the pressure you're under the the like intensity of building a business of that scale the 
the like resilience you have to have the vision you have to have the like there are moments where if you're trying to build a billion dollar business like people are going to write you off people are going to come after you um you know your employees aren't going to be happy like it's not natural to build a billion dollar business in eight years Mm. um like brew dog's a great example where um you know they've grown unnaturally fast and there's been some consequences for um you know some of their staff and people but i honestly don't think it is like feasible to create those size of businesses at that speed without like collateral damage and as a founder you have to be like pretty single-minded and pretty clear of like wow there's like some bad stuff going on or like some people not happy or you know things going wrong all the time and but i i'm like still super focused on my goal and what I'm going to do and how I'm going to get the company there and I'm going to like drag it through these periods and I'm going to you know basically make it kind of happen um and 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 I think um you know that that's incredibly draining and a huge amount of pressure and I think if you want to build like 10 20 30 million pound business and do that over like five ten year time horizon um you can do that and still have a um you know a healthy life outside of course you know most entrepreneurs they're thinking about their business every day and they're mm. super passionate about it but it um you, you, you you're not on that same you're not on that same like growth path and that same like pressure and like you know again it's like like we talked about funding and who you've got money from and what you're promising to them and what, what, what success looks like for everyone. And for some people, they want to go and like build that, you know, massive game changing, you know, billion dollar or bust. For me, that's, that was, that was like, I'm not sure I'm capable of it. I didn't, mm. you know, who knows, but I don't think I'm not sure I'm like a strong enough character to go and, to go and do that particularly in like a 10 year time horizon i think it's super difficult interesting yeah for, for everyone that's probably never started a business or was very early stages i feel like says yeah i want to build a billion pound brand you know whatever and then christ building 10 million pound of revenue is hard enough and yeah i i also think like take it step by step you know just you don't get too far ahead of yourself and and like that is more important than us forever like we can you know when things are going well you start dreaming you know you you got to stop yourself and be like what do we need to do next month and how do we like just go step by step by step and um it's incredibly like you know it, it's ultimately a game of snakes and ladders is is how i'd see the startup world and um you get a bit cocky when you roll a few doubles and you you get a few ladders and you're like ahead of everyone on the board and then you like get get on a snake and you're like backed behind the pack and you, you know you're having mm. to clamber back up again and and so you, you you you've got to try and keep level-headed and um you know and 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 i think the other dangerous thing is the cult of the founder these days where a lot of people become intertwined with their business their you know who they are and their personalities and i think a lot of people who build that pr story and become kind of that famous figurehead um i think you know i was reading a really interesting article from the founder of monzo and he was like Mm. everyone wanted me to succeed and i was in all the papers and everyone idolized monzo and then suddenly monzo became like quite big and quite successful and a bit of a target in the press and it changed from like people wanting to encourage them and support them to like people like trying to dig and find out what was going wrong or talk to like disaffected employees or Mm. you know write sensationalist pieces bringing these people down and you know that like uh, that definitely for me is you know there, there are lots of things of potentially being a ceo where you're the face of the business and you're part of the brand is it, it, it like looks great from the outside but it's kind of you know it's like becoming a, a modern day sort of celebrity and all the problems that come with that 
yeah, I guess, I guess I'm, I've been kind of publicly building my brand, well, on the YouTube and Twitter a little bit. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, like for example, their brand Instagram follows me and the podcast. So I'm very publicly the founder, which I don't know if that's, yeah, it's probably got good thing, good elements and bad elements. I mean... But you're, you're supporting the entrepreneurial community and you're, you're, you're kind of, you're... you're um you're, tr- you're trying to share people in your learnings and your lessons mm. and you're very open. And I think in the like business community, that's all kind of fine. It's when it starts to like move beyond the, the business world and move into, you know, the wider public domain. Um, yeah. You know, look at, look at the brew dog guy. He had like a BBC one the panorama on him. And he's just like, he's a, he's a founder. He's- I had the daily mail at my door about that two years ago. That, that, that was like you know, not they weren't, they weren't asking good questions so yeah, yeah so I kind of seen like a glimpse of how that, that could go um, well, Brew Dog's obviously another fucking level um, do, do you think the PR behind a startup though like being that kind of that spoken about D to C darling brand if you like surely that has benefits because I, I saw why I mean obviously I'm an entrepreneur so I fucking obsessively look at every startup like in London and the UK particularly D to C and I saw Wild as kind of a poster boy startup like startup yeah. brand I guess but that is that just because I'm looking at that stuff maybe but is, I, is I, that, I don't I don't is, I don't is I there actually, any intention behind the PR with I mean like we, we have that? PR agencies but the more I look back on this and stuff is like you, you don't really want to be the poster boy you want to be the under the radar people mm. who no one even knows about but it's like um who's just killing it and um and and doesn't you know not even needing to raise money and you know though that like a lot of the businesses that i now look up to you know are businesses that a lot of people haven't heard of it's like when i was going around talking about native no venture capital firm had ever heard of native but it's it's literally like the founder is in the top five founder exits ever in DTC. But no one in the DTC space has heard of him because he didn't raise any venture capital money. And mm. and for me, it's like um, yeah, like most of the like great operators and the the people who are really good um, are, are are brands that you've like mm, mm, are not so aware of or you you don't realise quite how well they are they are kind of dirty. He, like, he's he's got one of those brands jack behind us um, that, that, that's the yeah. thing and you're like and 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 they don't want to tell lots of people because it's like you know it's it's a it bit of a, competition yeah yeah it's a bit of a secret it's like we're doing really well we don't want lots of people to know about it and um you know i i, I think for me i love uh, you know podcasts and stuff are kind of fun and you share your story and and all that kind of thing but i think pr you also can get ahead of yourself and you start believing your own bullshit. You're like, yeah, I'm like, we're just killing it. And we're the, we're the poster, poster boy of it. And like things like the mattress world is, was like a really good lesson for me. And one of the best podcasts I've listened to is the founder of Eve sleep. Um, I've got an Eve mattress. Yeah. if If you hear his story though, crazy story, like naught to 10 million in 18 months. And they're like, we're going to be the, the earliest business ever to IPO. We're going to IPO 150 million, you know, and the founder was going to be worth, you know, huge amounts of money, huge, huge, huge amounts of money. The IPO, the business, and all starts going to complete shit. Mm. And, um, you know, both founders have to leave the business. Their shares are worth nothing. The company's one of the worst IPOs ever to have happened in the UK. And you, you've gone from like being this, darling and incredible company and like all these records being broken and all this hype and excitement and all this kind of you're going to be the next big thing to like brutally kind of ripped out of your own company and like kicked out on the street with with Mm. nothing to show for it and you know that is like a such an important lesson i think for founders that you, you you can't get too far ahead of yourself and you never know what's around the corner and I think you, yeah, if you, you need to be careful how you build your profile and how you w- want to be perceived. And, and I think, um, you, you know, a lot of people are getting that now and they're more vulnerable and they're more sharing their mistakes. But, you know, for me, 
we we don't we share our milestones because we're like want to keep investors and whoever like on the radar um and and maybe that you know we are creating slightly false narrative of wild mm. um but I, I, I don't i it's not my style to be like share, sharing everything openly i just I, 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 that's not how i want to build the business yeah definitely a fine line what do you think is the biggest lever you're pulling now then to get to that next level um it, or is there a few like a, what's so the main focus point for me at the moment it's it's like having the right people in place the right teams um and then you know a lot of the next phase of scale for us will come from um like still obsessing with our customers so like mps score really driving up that customer satisfaction trying to you know basically over there are two things that happen in subscription businesses cacs go up ltv drops over time that's just like those are the two trends that everyone is going to face whether they think mm. it or not and any naive d2c founder will put in their business model that cacs will come down and ltv will improve um that does like I've never seen that happen. So if you do make it happen, then you know within reason. If you're looking over like a five year time, so yeah. you know I'm thinking like, okay, how can I tolerate higher CACs, and how can I find ways to, um, you know, make more money from these customers who are not as core as those initial customers? Because basically, how your business works, right? In that first couple of months, you're. You, the algorithms and the, the way things work you find your like best best customers and then they get slightly worse the bigger mm. you kind of get and you've got to like re change your product and alter it to try and reach that wider audience and and cater for like a group that's just not that core cool customer so I think a lot about the product i think a lot about the website uh, website optimization is just the secret source of like most um dc businesses that are going from you know 10 20 million to like 50 million a mm. lot of it comes from getting really really good at cro and learning how to convert and make more money from the customers landing yeah. on the site um so I, I think that's a that's a huge area for us um and then kind of looking at new levers and new avenues for growth for the for the future and then finally team like have the right team in place Product-wise, are you moving outside the ocean? You've got soaps now, I think. Soaps isn't... And then beyond that. I, like, I don't co count soaps as like a product. Mm. Uh, that's more like an add-on for us just yeah. to like, you know, if you're buying wild and you want some soap, you can you can have some soap. But it's not like a... It, it's not a sp special product yeah. or something we, 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 we kind of done. So definitely the long-term vision for wild is to move into more products. But you're not going to see wild create like 10 products in a year it's probably going to be two maximum and they're all going to be focused on that kind of element of um, creating something permanent and beautiful in your bathroom and then something that's super easy to get rid of um, and, um, you know, w which means you don't have to compromise on your like current routines. Yeah, interesting. I very intentionally launched with like I said before literally one skew I'm trying to be careful not to overcomplicate it too much yet so I've got I've got the dream dust product coming then a kind of yeah a bunch of add-ons like accessory stuff I've got gradient mugs that look the same as that you know just upsell like buy three months up front get a mug all this sort of shit yeah just yeah. to kind of move play AV, around with play around with AV, play around with acquisition but I would say one of the biggest mistakes most people make is they like they they create too many products and they create too much too much complexity going on and you, you definitely mm. need it but you probably always need it a little less than you think particularly if things are going well it's like try and maximize and then have some things in the background that are kind of ready to go so you can move quite quickly mm. but you know only pull the trigger when you kind of when you kind of really need them Having said that, yeah. that's not why I haven't launched another product. I've just fucked up the MPD. Right, <laughs> really? So, so we're, we're running a... Yeah. We're, I'm about 12 months late on my uh, products are meant to have launched. But it, it, again, what it's highlighted is we, we're doing okay on deodorant and 
and the focus that the rest of the business has had on growing that side of the business has, has actually been a plus point. Yeah, because I look at Athletic Greens and I just think they've basically got one product and yeah. I would imagine they're doing nine figures in revenue, if not more. And it's like, and I take that shit every day now because I started to, I wanted to buy their stuff to see how simple it was. And I was like, well, wow, it's very simple, but it's very good. And it's just, yeah, being good at few things rather than okay at a lot of things. Yeah. Seems to be the approach. I, yeah, I, that's the, what I believe. Like, again, it's kind of a food analogy that I kind of learned in the food world of um, famous people are saying like one of the best restaurants they went to is, is like a restaurant that served eggs and chips and you're like how can that be one of the best restaurants but like it was the best fucking eggs and chips you could like yeah. ever imagine and and like they would have miles and miles of queues of people um to yeah. get to this restaurant deep rather than wide to get to this restaurant and 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 but they create like a huge cult following and for for me that like that story always sits in my in my brain of like just do one thing well to begin with and then the rest you know if people trust and believe in that and they like that the rest will kind of come and there are so many advantages in d to c to being simple skews um simple setup that scales fast and mm. like gets to market and grows without sapping too much capital and means you can invest all your money into growth which is what you want to do like you want to get to like 600k a million a month that like it's all about you're not you don't need loads of products to do that you just need to be super focused on acquisition yeah i mean i always said from the start i reckon i could get to a million a month just in the uk with one skew like hypothetically i mean i think the biggest yeah. problem now is stock i keep selling out yeah so i've got twenty thousand units on the way now which i mean yeah that was a bit of a arguably a risk buying that much stock but if it's selling it makes sense just to double down you, you, yeah and you're only having to buy 20,000 of one skew, you know that you know sells and yeah. like you're probably not pulling all the levers if you had to discount it or whatever to to, mm. to push it and like you know if you'd had four skews, you'd have to buy 5,000 of each and then exactly. you wouldn't yeah. you know and one wouldn't sell and one is selling and but you can't sell more of the good one because that's why I don't do any flavours it's just chocolate if you don't like chocolate go away yeah for now yeah and in the future you know the future it's a like also when investors are talking to you or people are interested in your business you're like yeah i mean this is what we're doing with one skew mm, like yeah think of where we can get to in the future and having that scissor like having that, that you know, if you're like we've got everything then they're like well where's the growth going to come from yeah interesting that is very 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 true yeah because there's so many categories and products i've kind of sampled already I'm like, oh, I would love to do this. But it's like, no, just keep it in the arsenal for later, prove the concept, and then, yeah, horizontally, vertically scale. There's so many things. I want to change the topic slightly then. How does your day-to-day -day look as a founder at this stage then now? Because, again, I think a lot of these conversations, just me trying to figure out how to best spend my time, obviously we're at very different stages. And how has that changed over the past three years, like, primarily? Um... I, I, you probably become just inherently a little bit more hands off because you just can't be on top of all the detail mm. of all the time. Like, you know, for the first year I was doing the operations. So I was, you know, ordering the stock, talking to all our suppliers, you know, building the forecasting tools, um, managing, you know, managing new partners, looking for ways to, to, to kind of scale, you know, now I'm probably a little bit zoomed out on that. Um, and what's weird is like my background's in growth and then my co-founder is actually the CMO in the business. He's better at it than I am. Um, so, you know, we're both quite growth minded and that's kind of what we enjoy doing. And then um, I, I happen to end up on more of the operations and finance side. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think I still try and stay quite hands on. I still try to think of like, the, the levers we have in the business and what we need to do to like deliver the day to day. But then there's probably more time now zooming out of like six months. Where do we, where have we got to go? What do we need to believe to kind of get there? And what are the things that are on track and what are the things that are not? And who do we need to hire or what do we need to do to like figure that, that out? And like, what are these like threats coming in or things that others in the business won't see or don't understand that I can prepare ourselves for and do things proactively so it's, it's a bit longer term and then you know i really try and 
articulate vision, values, um, and strategy, you know, as much as I can to the team. I, I, I try and create like a simple set of those and then really all the time, any opportunity I have to like talk to the team about those, how they're living the values, what those values mean, how that helps us to ladder up to our vision and where that all plays into what we're trying to deliver. I think that the hardest point at like 30 to 50 employees, which we're going through now, is that everything becomes more siloed and everything that's obvious in a small business, no one knows what's going on anymore. Mm -hmm. So like for me, you know, one of my things that I'm good at is communication. And one of the things I enjoy is communication. And so I spend a lot of time communicating what we're trying to do and what different departments are working on and, 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 and where we're going. Um, and then people become less happy because they've been in the company a longer time. You know, they they kind of get burnt out, or you know, they don't see their progression. Or so you know, thinking about the people and how we incentivize them and how we, you know, are respectful to those who've brought us this far, but also realize what we need to get to the next level. Mm. Um, that takes a lot of our time and focus. Yeah, just sounds like people management, which is what I need to get better at fundamentally yeah but you still got to like you know last week customer service over you still know in the trenches you, you still got to get on customer service and you still you know you still got to find you know um i'm still trying to like get people to do things that i think are going to move the business forward i'm not just like a high level strategist mm. um but the, the problem is is like it's like not always helpful if i half do a topic and then hand it over so i kind of have to be a bit more conscious about what i take on and who manages that and then there are some projects where i'm like i don't want anyone else to be just dis- like um distracted by this so i'm gonna take that on mm. and no one else needs to know about it until it's at a point where it's ready for the rest of the company to to come on board yeah interesting I hopefully have all of this ahead of me at a larger scale over the next few years did you have a like personal goal going into this business i mean I kind of do, I guess, like financially and obviously I want to build cool shit. Um, Like in terms of like a hierarchy of needs in terms of, you know, in a certain timeline, obviously you said you'd like to get to 100 million in six years, I think you said. Um, Again, was there like a personal exit plan, I guess, at the start and is there now? And, And also like, what is driving you the most is it you know the idea of changing an industry is it realizing you know personal gains from selling the business potentially or is it both and where where do they where do those different ambitions and goals sit because it's something i think about a lot so i'm like oh yeah i want to get really rich as an entrepreneur don't we all but i also want to do something that potentially impacts the world positively (laughs) depending on what time of day you ask me there's philanthropic goals are probably higher or lower on the pecking order but how, how about you i think for me um so, so like when i started it was like well if it goes well then you know we all make money and we have a good time and and that's great and if it doesn't go well you know i'll, I'll learn a lot from it and I'll, mm. I'll figure out that i'm not really a founder or um i'm not part of it i think um you know, I, I've become more aware now of like just enjoying the process and not getting too focused about the like that outcome at the end. Um, so like I'm running a business with one of my best mates. Um, it's going pretty well and um, it's good. For, like it, I'm super lucky to be able to come into work and enjoy what I do and bring people along the way and and kind of create jobs and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and, and, you know, again, I look back at HelloFresh and I just had the most amazing time and the, like made loads of really great friends and, and, and really enjoyed that. Um, so I think part of me is just like, you know, in, enjoy the ride, enjoy the, you know, enjoy the day to day, enjoy mm. the moments where it doesn't even, you know, realize that the like, moments where it's going disastrously wrong are the stories that you'll tell on the podcast in you know 12 18 months time and you'll look back on it and you know even if it all collapses like 
you, you kind of can look back and go, hey, that I didn't waste those years of my life doing this. I, I, I it was really worth it and and really enjoyable because the problem with like a financial outcome is, you know, as as we've seen, it's so um, that there's so many factors that play into it, and some that you can control and some that you can't. And if you um, if you're too focused on on just that, then I think um, you know it, it, it can get super stressful because there are things sometimes you just can't make it happen, or it's it's not going to work for you, or or things are not going in in that kind of right direction. Um, and I think probably longer term, it's not like the idea of loads of money um, is is like I don't think about it that that much, but. I more think about being able to prove that I, you know, I can do it. I can build, you know, we can build a business and we can do something cool. And, um, and yeah, you know, now I'm a dad, it's about being able to say to my children, you know, look, we, we built something that in some small way, um, you know, was moving things in the right direction towards some of the problems we have. And, um, you know, we tried to do some innovation that was um, that, that that was moving moving that forward. Um, and then, you know, there's probably another thing of like now there's a bit more like it's less about making loads of money, but making enough money to to look after your family and to support them and to be able to give them the opportunities that I've had is is like is important and it's um, it it probably you you lose some of that like super high risk go big or go home yeah and it's more like you know let's build something that is sustainable in 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 financially as well as um in its like output of what it's delivering yeah interesting i, I definitely yeah it's a fine line in between go big and go home and actually you know if someone said to me you can 20% chance of building a billion pound brand or 90% chance of building a 20 million pound brand. <laughs> Probably going for the latter. When I was 18, maybe I'd have said the first one, but when you've been in the trenches for a few years, you realize that it ain't easy. Yeah, and, and, and there's a thing of like, you know, they can be equally satisfying and you can get a lot of enjoyment from both and, and neither is right or wrong. Um, and different points in your life, you'll probably have different views on on where you want to fit on that scale. But I think when you start a business and you go through like who your investors are, who the people you're bringing on the journey, who you're hiring, like for me, it's all geared towards um, you know the sort of company I want to build, which which is kind of um, you know is more around that kind of sustainable growth, getting profitable early in our you know, relatively early in our life cycle and having our destiny in our own hands and doing all we can to like get the best outcome possible, but not having to like, as I said, knock the lights out every single month that, mm. that you know, and get into this kind of funding frenzy is, um, you know, I've been lucky so far that we haven't had to to, to go down that route and, and that that's been a good thing. Interesting. Final few questions. Um, so I could pick your brain all night, probably. If you had one bit of advice for me then at this early stage, so I've got a solid proof of concept. I guess probably arguably the most potentially stressful bit is over. Because Well, not over, but like people want to buy the product. Something's working. You know, in the next two years or even year to scale up to maybe equivalent of where you were and beyond, If you know, What's the one thing largely I should focus on, knowing what you know about the business, which is relatively little, but based on this conversation? Yeah, I can, I can have a good idea of the space. You know, um, I, I think what I've hopefully tried to articulate throughout our chat is like keep things simple, and then you know build your growth loops. They, you know, build things that scale, um, and if you can if you can build a growth engine then all of that stuff will start to just you create a flywheel that that will start to to run and build and and you've 
you've done the hard part which is you've created a product that people like and people want and the the like secret sauce to the next phase is just do figure out those growth loops that allow that to go viral to to, mm. to create that virality and your role should be like how do i get this into more people's hands at the you know what is that cost that i can pay and how do i spend as much as possible and like every month it should be how can i spend more on marketing but keeping that efficient yeah very true yeah it is simple as we life simple isn't it? we just make it complicated and i guess the trenches feel are complicated a lot of the time i've got 25 internet tabs open trying to fucking get through my list which is never ending um what do you think has been the hardest thing about scaling a dc brand to what statistically is very successful compared to most i would imagine um broadly speaking you know in like a I think the 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 operational side of growing fast is is really tough and there are just moments where you know particularly in the last 12 months stuff stuck on boats you know staff in the Suez Canal. like yeah i mean the, the, look, look like um felix stowe is shutting down for a week next week royal mail is striking the week after um you know all of these things are like completely out of your control and suddenly you're like you know, we're not going to have any stock, we're not going to have any product, we're not going to be able to fulfill for our customers. Like those moments where you just feel helpless um, and, um, you know, there are external factors that you can't control that are like bringing, bringing your business down or like really putting your business under a lot of, in a lot of jeopardy is, is the hardest thing to, to learn to deal with. And, you, you have to learn to focus on what you can control and not worry about, um, you know, we buy quite a lot of stuff in dollars. Mm. Um, that was a very good way to be buying things six months ago. It's a very bad way to be buying things now. Mm. And, you know, we probably lost 10 percentage points margin from from that swing from where dollar was to where it is. And um, that's super stressful, but it's like, it's nothing I can do about it. And so like I can either get upset about it or I can just focus on what we can do and what what I am in control of, and try and you know just forget about those external factors and and realize that's a way of life. Sometimes they're going to be good for you, and sometimes they're not. And you, you know, if you're going to be a successful business over ten years, you're going to have moments where there's a recession, there's like um, there's logistics problems, there's like probably a couple of like things that nearly kill your business, and you you just got to like live through those moments and try and do whatever you can to survive. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So it's a bumpy road. All right. Final question, which I ask everyone on the pod now, which is very cliche, but maybe quite introspective and interesting. If you could give three bits of advice to your 18 year old self, you know, knowing what you know now along the journey, which is, I guess, still relatively early stages in life, but what, what, what would they be? you know covering every area of life potentially not just specifically d to c i think you know definitely in your 20s just kind of enjoy that freedom and you know both in your career and in your um personal life you, you um you have a lot of energy you have a lot of time that like you don't have a huge amount to lose um you don't have a lot depending on you and that's incredibly freeing when you look back on it and at the time certain things stress you out that just shouldn't stress you and you know so i think your 20s is all about i'd be like look fred it's all about learning don't worry about what you're getting paid and what your mates in banking are getting paid or you know how successful this person is and that person it's like life is a long you know hopefully a long race and and like patience is actually super super important um and and kind of enjoying the moment and and living that and then you know one of the things is like take take risks like it you know maybe they work out some will some won't but you'll never regret taking risks and you'll learn from the failures and you'll um for the risks that like pay off you know those can like change your life and Mm. that's that's super exciting and um uh, you know, I've, I've never regretted doing things that have felt uncomfortable at the time when I now look back on them. I'm like, 
those were, were, were good things to do. And yeah. maybe I think the one thing is I, I probably would have liked to have done a year or two years outside of somewhere abroad, somewhere where you could just, it's a different culture, like you're just a bit out of your comfort zone. Yeah. But you can, you know, you again, you have to like dig deep and, and find something. So um, that wasn't to be, but I look back and, and feel like that would have been something cool to do to, to where I am now. Definitely. Sick. Um, again, I could probably ask you a billion other questions, but that's been an hour and 40 minutes and I feel like we should probably wrap it up soon. Yeah, it's been super interesting. Um, I've definitely learned a lot which I'm going to go away and think about. I think keep it simple is definitely a good message at this stage for me and probably for a lot of founders watching um, and people that want to be founders. But yeah, it's a fucking hard road. And I think what you said at the start about things maybe seeming like everything's perfect and easy from the outset, which probably a lot of people do to a lot of founders, but then you actually hear it from the horse's mouth and it's still the trenches. Lots lots of ups and downs, this is, regardless of scale. Yeah, and it's like in some ways there's more like there's just there's like you've got more suppliers relying on you you've got more people relying on you there's you know the the, the pressure changes and it's different but it, it it's like it's a different intensity and um you know it, it doesn't it, it's no it's not like um it's not any easier than it is now and the risks are still you know everything remains on a knife edge for a long period of time and you you got to get comfortable with that at every part of the journey but keep taking those risks and keep you know wanting to push things forward mm. and and you you know you will get there and like i think it sounds like you've got off to an amazing start and you've got as i said if you have a good product that people want people like then the rest is relatively just like mechanical and figuring out how to to get that to a wider audience yeah definitely simple but hard it's probably like the closing message yeah. um yeah super interesting chat as usual if you're liking the pod subscribe recommend to a friend um this is very d to c focused ones P people should love this i've been getting complaints about speaking about like philosophy and shit and stoicism so we kept this pretty focused i think people can definitely learn a lot from it i certainly did um as usual cheers for watching we'll see you in the next episode Peace.